Hello, Belleville youth. I know this is your first day of VBS and the topic today is God keeps his promises. And we're gonna be looking at the life of Joseph and today we're gonna to be looking at Genesis chapter 37. But before we get into that, we're gonna, I wanna outline some things as it relates to God and keeping his promises. I want you to not think of God as keeping his promises the way humans keep his promises because humans oftentimes fail at keeping them, right? But God is not a human. He does not change his mind. In Numbers 23, 19, it speaks about this. Take a moment and look that up. We can trust God to come through because God is faithful. It is contrary to his divine nature to lie or to make an empty promise. So keep that in mind. There are five principles to think about when it comes to God's promises. Um, the first one I've already addressed, God always keeps his promises. Second one is some promises are for specific people. So think of uh, the promise he gave to David that he would establish his kingdom. He would establish a person on the throne. That's in 1 Kings 9, 5. That was a promise that was specifically give, given to David. Um, some promises are unconditional. So think about Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, where God promises to Noah that he will never destroy the earth with a flood again. Uh, some promises are conditional. So think about James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, humble yourself before God, resist the, the devil, and he will flee from you. So there's a promise that the devil will flee from us, but it's conditional based on us humbling ourselves before God and choosing to say, I resist the devil, I don't want that influence in my life anymore. And then the fulfillment of that promise is that the devil will flee. And the last thing is to note that sometimes people apply principles instead of a promise. So for what I mean by that is a principle is not a promise. So in Proverbs 22, six, it talks about train a child in the way he should go and the way when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is a principle, it's not necessarily a promise, even though we pray that by God's grace, they will still choose, you know, you will choose, that I will always continually choose Christ. It's a principle. So today we're going to get into today's lesson and it's Genesis chapter 37. And I'm very excited for this text. There's so much going on in this chapter. So before we open the Bible, we're gonna begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that you are a God that keeps your promises. We know that your word is for us at this time in our history, that each and every young person you desire to speak to them individually and personally. So I pray today that as they listen to this video, as they reflect on the message, as they study the passage, Lord, that you'll speak to each one of them individually and personally. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's begin. In Genesis chapter 37, it begins with this really interesting introduction and it's really important when you study the Bible to think about the introduction. So in Genesis chapter 37, it begins, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger. This is very important and I'll come back later. In the land of Canaan. He was in this specific place in Canaan, which it talks about later on. And then it begins, this is the history of Jacob. And it's interesting because it says, this is the history of Jacob. And then it starts talking about Joseph. And this is why it's interesting. In verse two, the exact same words are used in a chapter before. So it doesn't bring this out in the new King James, but if you have the King James version, it has the exact same wording. So in the King James version, it says, this is the generation of Jacob. In chapter 36, verse one, it says, this is the genie, this is the generation of Esau. Now Esau and Jacob were two brothers, right? They didn't, they disagreed. One was following after God's will. The other didn't want the spiritual blessing. Jacob wanted the spiritual blessing, Esau did not. So in chapter 36, it gives the, the genealogy, it gives the generations of Esau. And it's just a list of names and a couple different facts about each person. Now, in verse 37, we come to the generation of Jacob. And in the generation of Jacob, it begins to tell a story. Now the Bible never wastes words. There's something significant and unique and very important that God wants us to understand about the generation of Jacob. And in the generation of Jacob, it begins with the story of Joseph. And we pick up in verse two, it said Joseph being 17 years old, 
Some of you may be 17 or be close to being 17, so you could probably really relate to Joseph. Um, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with his son, with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, the father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. So there's a couple of things going on here. When you're studying the Bible, look at the introduction. So we have the context that this is a very important generation, of important genealogy that the that Moses is is bringing to our light. Moses was the author of Genesis, and in verse two, it introduces Joseph to us. Now we've obviously heard about Joseph before in terms of his birth, but this begins to tell us something very specific. And what we find out is that he's called a lad. How many of you have ever been called a child? It's very discouraging sometimes because you know that God has taught you lessons and that you're growing and that you're not a child. But in here, he identifies him as a child. He doesn't obviously disagree with it, um, but he identifies him as a child, a lad. And he was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. These were specifically Gad, Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. And these guys were not doing things that were good. And he's like, hey, dad, this is what they were doing. Kind of like a tattletale, unfortunately. Um, it wasn't necessarily, we don't know the, the extent. We don't know if he was telling it just to get in trouble or whatever it may be. But he told his dad. And it began to create this jealousy. Um, Jacob favored Joseph. And so it created this jealousy between him and his brothers. And it, it, could, it culminates at the moment when jo Joseph has these dreams. Now, dreams were very, very important at that time. And Joseph has the dreams and he tells them that the sheaves bow down to him, his sheaf, and the sun, moon, and stars bow down to him. And so even his dad is like, uh, am I and your mother going to bow down to you? And so there's this kind of pushback. But even in, in Jacob's heart, he's like, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what this means. And so fast forward, the dreams have passed and his brothers are in Shechem. Now, his dad is very, very concerned. Think about, why do you think his dad is concerned for his brothers? Now, if you know anything about the story of Jacob and his, his sons, there's a very dark and sad history of something that happened in Shechem that caused them to leave. I'm not gonna tell what that is, but I'm gonna ask you to look it up. It's very interesting. So Jacob is concerned for his, his sons and says, Joseph, please come here. He says, here I am. He's like, I want you to go to your brothers and see how they're doing. Now, there's a very interesting detail that I want us to read here. And this is, I think, goes back to this idea that God keeps his promises, right? God keeps his promises. So let's look at verse 14, okay? So this is, Joseph comes to his dad and says, here I am. Then Jake, Jacob says to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So... He sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now that doesn't seem very significant to you at all. It doesn't seem very, and to me either. And I looked it up. I said, what is the valley of Hebron? I looked it up. Did you know that the valley of Hebron is where Sarah was buried? Uh, Joseph's mother or Joseph's grandmother, great grandmother. The Valley of Hebron is also the place in which Abraham left to go down to Egypt. Now, when Joseph leaves he, the Valley of Hebron, where does he finally end up going? Does he ever come back to the Valley of Hebron? He doesn't because what happens? He ends up going to Shechem. There's a guy there that tells him, hey, your brothers are in Dothan. He gets to Dothan. They, show, they throw him in a pit and they plan to actually kill him. But then they decide to sell him for 20 pieces of silver, and he ends up on this journey to Egypt. I can't help but wonder that as he's on that journey, on his way to Egypt, if he begins to recall the stories of his great-grandfather Abraham and how Abraham had made this journey to Egypt. Now, Joseph was under a very different circumstances than Abraham was, but I wonder if that promise, the promise that he had made to Abraham, Many years ago, called back to Joseph's mind, and he had purposed in his heart because God had, God had led Abraham down to, to Egypt, and, and he had left the Valley of Hebron. He left the Valley of Hebron and went down to Egypt. That was one of his journeys down to Egypt was when he left the Valley of Hebron.
And I wonder if that is where the promise of God became so personal to him because he's like, wow, if God led Abraham and he is my God, I believe that I can claim his promises and remember that God keeps his promises. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust God. And so as he's making this journey, it follows with, it ends with this really sad situation. But the reality is, is um, God begins to work out this promise that he had made to Abraham many years ago. So take a look at the text, read it. There's all, all kinds of amazing, amazing, amazing um, principles and lessons that we learn about God's love. So take a, take a look at it. And remember, God always keeps his promises.